This is the stuff dreams are made of. I'm writer collector Ryan Condal. And I'm writer collector Dave Mandel. And you're listening to the original movie prop collecting podcast, The Stuff Dreams Are Made Of, brought to you by Heritage Auctions, HA.com. They've got a giant Ruby Slippers spectacular auction coming up in December. I don't have the dates yet, but maybe someone will put them here. The coming, the dates are December 7th, 2024. There, put them right in there. Yeah, that'll be perfect, right? <laughs> That's very. How you good. doing? Who who is going to do your voiceover, Dave? Who would you choose to to do the, the David want, Mandel voice? I don't want this to sound like I don't want this to sound racist, but I'd like to do the reverse of like an overdubbing. So I would okay. like a very like a strong Asian accent, okay? Or sort. But a real an actual fine. Asian person, not somebody yeah, yeah. doing a doing comment, it, yeah, yes, an actual right. someone. Yeah, it's funny clearly, because what yeah. popped into my head uh, is an Asian person, but uh, an, an Asian American person was Aquafina. I don't know for some oh. reason it just felt like that would fit I very that well. Could fit with really nicely, your, yeah, your vibe, yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, my children have gotten to know her voice very well because she's voiced a number of like cartoon characters in their movies. Oh, is that like, what she's hey, up to? The dragon from because it's just so it's so distinct, and I had to explain and and you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles I think as well. So oh, funny. Yeah, it's, yeah. I I used to see all it's of those all movies, and now my kids are just yeah. I think like my kids occasionally are still watching kid movies, but we're not all going together. together. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, exactly. Nin so. I, I think I've talked about this before, but that Ninja Turtles movie is awesome, and yeah, anybody who missed yeah, it, yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it is the best filmed Ninja Turtles. I, I I say that being a fan of the originals very much as a kid. It's the best one. It really is the best one since like the cartoon and since the Eastman and Laird. Like it, it captures the Eastman and Laird books the best yeah. of anything, I think. And it's I really thought it interesting. It's really animation. good. And I kept meaning Great to watch story. it. Okay. Uh, the character work and the, and the, the, the trick of it is that they, um, they actually made them teenagers. So they're sort of bumbling kids that don't really know their place in the world yet and they're incredible ninjas but otherwise like socially and and of course they're mutant turtles and all that um they are it, th that part is was sort of the secret sauce to me but it's very worthwhile seeing a beautiful nice. animation check that out. yeah do your Highly kids recommend. care at all about this like transformers one that came out like i tried recently? and they're just like i showed them the trailer and they were just like oh that's cool I, they would go but right neither one of them was like oh i gotta go see that i mean if they think if they were you know not to you know gender stereotype but i think if they were boys they would both be like, oh, I got to go see the giant transforming robots. Right. I just well, think it's definitely cool. aimed at kids, but you're right. Probably a little more towards boys. Yeah, cars you know, and guns. I'm just and, curious. Yeah. You know, if it, fighting if and it all that. entered their world, so to speak. They but, do know. really want to see this wild robot, though. They're very, very into I've that. I've heard very nice things about that from a bunch of yeah. people. Um, have you ever shown them uh, Iron Giant or not yet? Yes, that's which they I love. Did. I yes. think there are similarities. Yes, like, it feels. Like I can yeah. see. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. But they, that, like but they that. Really, really, really like that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I like hearing that. Yeah. Um, so uh, what's new in props, Dave? Um, I got a couple of things. I mean, uh, sort of, uh, sort of slowly going with uh, my ongoing just various projects. You know, uh, they're all sort of, you know, take everything's baby steps. You know, uh, I shipped a the man a top of a mannequin off to Gino who's got it done and he's waiting to ship it back and then he's going to come out and we're going to get that project going uh the x-wing display is sort of you know being worked on but not back with me yet and Great. so everything is very whatever so not a lot of not a lot of new i will say uh in terms of uh like props but uh that has allowed me of course uh to, to kind of uh go back a little to comic art which is always uh always a good whatever uh when when oh if i that's can't spend clean, money yeah that's if i clean, can't spend like, money three, four week process yeah. right you yeah. put it the framer and it's in four weeks you have it back there's that yeah. there's less faffing to be done yes there. but also it just sort of that kind of thing of like well i'm not spending money on props how can i spend some money on comic art but uh, a piece came my way that it, this is such a stupid thing because i you, you, like Normally, you know, we show off a piece of comic art or I show off a piece of comic art and you're like, oh my God, it's that thing, whatever. This is definitely falls into the category of something that I can't imagine you ever even saw this issue. I don't even know if you, you, you may know the character. It's like semi-obscure, like, you know, 80s DC kind of popular, but not really, I don't know okay. if it was ever really mainstream. Uh, I loved the DC character Ambush Bug. Do you know Ambush Bug? I, I do, yes. 
Yeah, yeah uh, I've creative... never read a book, but okay. I, I, I know um, the character, yeah. Uh, Keith Giffen, uh, who passed away, uh, I think last year, uh, uh, was the sort of the, the driving force behind, uh, ambush bug. Um, and it was a character that he introduced when he was working on, uh, Superman action comics and DC comics presents. And it started off as a, sort of a very, just sort of, uh, like, like very, ana- like just pure anarchy, like almost like a loon, like a loon, like almost adding like a Looney Tunes element to Superman, which was just a very funny thing. And they're very, just really right. funny comics. And then as ambush bug kept going, he started to sort of start break. He started to break the fourth wall and it just kind of developed into this other thing. And they did these mini series that were sort of comics about comics. And I just, it's a huge influence on me just comedically, but also I just really oh. love it. And I have a bunch of his early appearances, but he appeared in one issue of Supergirl very early on. And I was able to finally pick this up from a, a collector. This is the Supergirl issue. Sorry, I'm trying to like oh, fantastic. What the best way is so that's the Supergirl yeah. issue. So the cover on by him. Yeah. And obviously the who's who is a <laughs> reference to the old uh to the old DC comics sort of like that was like the Marvel universe to the who's yeah. who. Um, and this just definitely falls under the category of something that like, I am always very happy to love and be one of the few people that love. And I, I, you know, I paid X I'm, you know, it, it's a lot less than, you know, whatever an X wing, but it's like, I'm <laughs> not sure there's a lot of competition for it, but I am really happy to have it. So yeah. uh, it goes into my ambush bug collection. I as love they it. Say. But, uh, yeah. It is the monkey radiator caps of comic original comic art. It's a very specific thing just to, to me, but I, I'm really quite thrilled. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, really just happy. And thank you. Uh, I will say Nick, be the guy who sold it to me so thank you nick there you go. uh Thanks. yeah so very excited about that so a little bit of a little bit of comic i'm actually going to probably pop it out of that frame i don't know if i'm going to put it back in a frame or i'm just going to put it in the book where i have my other ambush bug stuff but i'm going to pop it out of that frame not, not that there's anything wrong with it but i just don't i don't think it's going right on the wall I'm sort of trying to figure that out but anyway that's what that's where i am at this this at this moment in the, in the juncture uh, how about you anything new in props uh, I actually have I have comic guard updates, oh, Dave. We sort of, we've, we've sort of been teasing this and kind of looking for an on-topic episode, and as it will be revealed uh, momentarily, this is very on-topic for uh, comic books, if if not comic book movies. Um, uh, I I I suddenly have like a comic guard collection, there and, you go. Uh, and it happened. And I picked up a couple of pieces over the summer, which I was very excited about. And uh, we'll post pictures on the feed um, so you can see uh, see what's going on. Um, I was very lucky. We know that I I picked up that that Watchmen page, which sort of started the gorgeous, avalanche. Yep, I have gorgeous, those. Yep. I have those very that very cool Hellboy spread from the Wolves yep. of Saint August very early on. So gorgeous. Yep. Um, s- randomly this summer, a, a fellow prop collector emailed me and said, "Hey, you like Hellboy?" I'm raising funds. Do you want this? And sent me a splash page from Seed of Destruction, <laughs> which is the first Hellboy story. And it's Hellboy versus Cthulhu. And he's he's saying, what the, and the tentacles are grabbing it's him. It's literally pushing him up everything you would want in one single everything, page. Yeah. Everything you would want yeah. in one image. And it's, I mean, it's great. And I loved the image when it was sent and it must've been in a drawer for it's whitey white, the, the material, you know, the page and the, it's in perfect condition and God, it's just, uh, it's, Ryan, it's, I don't see comic art color. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> That's true. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, I was actually, I was shocked at how, how new it, it looked and how well kept it was. And there's something just, beautiful it, about that where it feels like, Oh, like you just grabbed it off of Mignola's drawing table. Like that sense yeah, of it. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. out of a museum that yeah. it properly took care of it the whole time. Cause some of this stuff gets very yellow over because of how it's stored or, sure. or simply, I think the stock of the paper that's on. Right. I mean, that that's, that's another sort of I think it has though solution. more to do with like sun, often just sunlight is a big sunlight. or people yeah. sometimes people framing it and it hitting the sun and whatnot but yeah 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 um so I was very excited to get that and then very unexpectedly this summer uh an opportunity at a very great rocketeer page came along um and as you know I'm a big fan of Dave Stevens and the documentary and the whole story and I grew up with the rocketeer more the movie than the comic book but I'm certainly aware of the comic book and love his art uh, particularly I just I just love I, that one I regarded as like I just love the artist and yeah. this is his magnum opus and it's it's a uh, again we'll post it on the feed but it's a fantastic 
uh, page from the second story, and it's actually the the, the splash page. I mean, it's, it has the Rocketeer title on it, and it has that famous image of him in that in you know jetting into flight. I think it's right. his first first proper flight, and it's the image that gets turned into the logo and all that. It's a very very famous image. So I'm now the proud owner of that, which is uh, just mind blowing to me. So, so suddenly I have this like proper comic art collection. And then um, very lucky was uh, was exchanging some uh, pleasant notes with uh, the wonderful artist Kelly Jones uh, over the past uh, uh, couple of weeks, months. And um, I'm a big fan of this. I'm a big fan of Kelly's you know, period is wonderful artist and particularly a big fan of this uh, story that he did called Gotham After Midnight. It's sort of Kelly's kind of his world of Gotham, right? It's it's a his, very his style and his Batman in general leaned into horror. I mean, just, horror. His, yeah, yes, yeah. his Batman, even when it was a you know regular Batman story, there was this just the way he draws it kind of evokes a certain thing. But that book in particular was him leaning into it. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. without the not the vampire, not the yeah. horror horror. This is right. like. Batman is normal, but like crazy stuff is happening after midnight in Gotham. Yeah. And um, there's the character named Midnight and all the villains kind of come. To, it's this very madcap sort of, you know, big comic booky version of Gotham. And uh, it's his Batman with the tall ears and all that. And um, we were talking about, you know, what he, he kind of has all the art and, what, you, know, you know, what do you like and whatever. And we kind of landed on the the cover of the trade paperback, uh, oh, which is the thing that I have. And it's the it's the right. thing that I read. It. It's the cover right. and it's, perfect, yeah. uh, it's a fantastic cover. And um, Kelly was very good to me. So um, we don't have that yet. That's coming. So maybe I'll do an unboxing video for that and then we'll post that on the feed. But um, but that uh, so there you go. I mean, I just Look suddenly have a, yeah. a folder filled with with comic art. And, well, you're doing i will say you are you are uh what's the word i'm looking for the rigor with which you sort of collect your props you are applying to your comic art you very much feel like you're kind of doing and look i think there's something to be said for i think even i if i were starting comic art today i think it's probably how i would collect as well which is kind of a one and done sort of philosophy yes. just because the as crazy as the prop numbers are the the the, the comic art numbers are just bananas can and, be but more bananas yeah. but also there's I mean, great stuff it depends. You can actually, yes of course yes. of course yeah. yeah and so obviously you can get an ambush bug piece without breaking the bank yeah. but all of a sudden if you start wanting a burn x-men piece it does start yes. to add up or wolverine yes. frank miller wolverine right. whatever it is right. so i think what you're doing which is to say like you have a a rocketeer piece where you do not need another rocketeer nope. piece and i think that kelly jones you're not going to ever need another kelly jones piece again you're welcome to get another kelly jones piece but you won't need another kelly jones piece same thing with your watchman piece same you know it's watchman, like yeah. it's it's sort of perfect and, and with help and with hellboy yes. now really. and the funny thing yeah. in which i guess we'll, we'll see what happens at some point is i do think your new hellboy piece is so good i do think those other two pages will eventually leave you someday someday, Maybe, someday. but i do yeah. love them too and i love that it's the i know but i do think and, you'll yeah. the, that this one though when once it's like in a frame and on yes. the wall but what yeah. will happen is something yeah. else will walk in the door that <laughs> yes something will come along and you will whatever but i know it's it's a good it's a good you're showing good discipline at least if mm. nothing else so yeah yes yeah. well thank you well done well so, done well so, done and i and i've also narrowed my my like hit list because it's really helped me well, sort you've of zero made on... your list which is the most important yes. thing you're not just like going i like that i like look at that i yeah, like that yeah, yeah. And you're not really reading a lot i mean you are reading things if someone recommends them to you but you're not necessarily doing the full like oh my god you're picking up 20 books every week or 10 no, books no, every no, week no, yeah no. or any of that no, so, I'm, re yeah. I'm reading collections I'm, yeah. i've been doing a lot of that things and... that people are recommending to you and yeah. then you're just yeah maybe i want something yeah from that. Maybe and I things don't. that yeah. I, i'm aware of that i missed and i'm, I'm having all that fun but um, but yeah, I mean, I, I you know, my my list. I'm going to recommend. Basically... A, I'm going to recommend a, a, a comic to you really quickly. Oh, okay. a, a longtime listener of the podcast, and we said hello to him uh, at Comic Con. Uh, Tom King, who is a wonderful oh, yes, comic writer yeah, 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 uh, in yeah. general, and I'm Batman loving a writer. lot of his books. Yes, uh, but he has a new book that he's doing. Uh, I believe it's Dark Horse, uh, and uh, mm. it's uh, it's really great, and I think it's very it would be very up your alley. Issue five just came out. I think it's six issues total to come, so there will be a collection. They're up to issue five, or if you wait for issue six, you could buy them in singles. Uh, the book is called uh, Helen of. Now I'm not going to pronounce this correctly. I'm going to actually make sure I'm, or at least uh, hmm. uh, uh, Helen of Windhorn, and it's kind of. Uh, his play on Edgar Rice, Bur like an Edgar Rice Burroughs world, if 
like Burroughs wasn't just writing, but also was there going like, go, like, uh, like had okay. access to some sort of Hibernian. Okay. I, I'm not doing it justice, but it's fantastic. I really love this book. Five issues. Uh, okay. The sixth, the sixth one is coming soon. Uh, gorgeous art by uh, 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 Bill Quist, who did the Supergirl mm -hmm. story that your mm -hmm. actress uh, Millie is going to be the Supergirl mm -hmm. from that story. I don't know if you ever looked at that that graphic novel. It's nope. really wonderful, too. Uh, that's his uh, Tom King's uh, Supergirl story. Um, Bill Quist Everly, I believe is how you pronounce it. I'm uh, Forgive me if I'm mangling the name. Uh, she's the, 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 the artist on this. It is just gorgeous, but it is a really really enjoyable story i just really like the world it's playing in and the, the, the like the influences the pulp the collect there's there's an aspect of collectors in it too ah, okay. uh, it's really nice stuff and it's a little bit period as well uh, very enjoyable highly recommend check that out so that's my great I'm, comic recommend yeah but uh, yeah thank you yeah um so uh speaking so of should... batman so well, do you want me to give a quick rundown of the of my top five that where, oh, yeah. where What's I your am? List? Yeah. Should, I, should I do that? So what's, Jim Lee what's X to be gotten a Jim Lee Jim, X Men, yeah. Jim Lee X Men page, of course Miller Wolverine limited right. series page. Weapon X Barry Windsor Smith. We you know Weapon X Barry there. Windsor yep. Smith. McFarlane Spider Man. Mm -hmm. But only uh, Spider Man, right? You don't care about Hulk. You don't care about any of the other McFarlane. I stuff. love the I love I would love a Hulk Wolverine, but like that's been sort sure. of uh, that's in there, but uh, a little crazy. Uh, yeah. Hulk yep. Wolverine. Uh, a collaboration. Yep. Um, uh, and I'm sorry. Of... Last question. I maybe I've asked you this yeah. before, but I can't remember. On your McFarlane Spider-Man, do you care? Like there was the McFarlane Spider-Man on the Amazing Spider-Man, and then there's the Adjectiveless Spider-Man when he was. I the prefer Adjectiveless because uh, that was the one that I was. That's what you read reading, gotcha. and Spider-Man gets a little bit more zany and sort of McFarlane-y in that yep. run, and those are the just the one I remember all that art, and that's the. They that's... are it's gorgeous art. Uh, I am a hundred percent the opposite. Amazing. Yeah, I know. Man. I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's generational yeah. and all that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and the final is uh, Rob Liefeld, New Mutants. Yep. You know, something from that run, something cable, I think, because cable was the, the character that less. Sure. And it, it, we will get to this when that auction goes. But there is there is uh, Deadpool's first appearance uh, is coming up for for auction. And everybody's saying that it's going to be the second highest selling piece of comic art. Yeah, in, it's going to be bananas. So you can bid on it. We'll see. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw a bit. <laughs> yeah. You can feel like, hey, I bid one hundred thousand yeah. dollars. I lost, but I got yeah. to bid one hundred thousand yeah. dollars. That was fun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, it's um, gonna go bananas. Yeah. So it's we'll 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 recap that. So I don't need that page, but uh but hopefully this shakes loose some other cable pages from that, you know, that great sort of 13 issue run. That just Obviously there are a lot of pages. I think yes. unfortunately that as these numbers, it's gonna make everybody delusional. Like everybody's yeah. gonna think that their page is the, the Deadpool page, the but yeah. such collecting life. Yeah. One yes. thing begets another. But eventually yeah. something will go in auction, maybe not sell, so or or at least like not do what they wanted. Anyway, yeah, that's yeah. such as and the I'll ups be there. and downs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The ups and downs. Um, yeah. But as you previously tried to segue, Dave, speaking of Batman, speaking of uh, Batman, <laughs> we have a fantastic guest tonight. Uh, his name is Julian Cadlow. He is the designer of the Batmobile. I mean, he he will he will humbly it's so funny. say he has an amazingly long career that I mean, he is yeah. still actively working. He did Harry Potter. He worked on. The creature uh, the, effects the, and yeah, aliens. Yeah, the Martian. But, you know, <laughs> most recently, I think he's been working on a three-body solution. I mean, the man has he worked on Game worked, of Thrones. Yeah, Game of Thrones, everything. And yet, in sort of a funny way, on his tombstone, designer of the Batmobile. Designer of the yeah, Batmobile. Yeah, which is like more the, or less... It's more or less first his first job, job his first yeah. job, and the first thing he kind of actually designed at the first job. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But he's a, a conceptual artist, a storyboard artist. He designed the Batmobile. He designed the Batwing. He designed Bat props. We're going to get into all of it. His illustrious career. Uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mr. Julian Cadlo. Uh, Julian, thank you for joining us. It's uh, so lovely to have you. Nice yes, pleasure. We are really excited, Julian. I feel like this is a very, uh, hopefully not a waste of your time. I feel like Ryan is simply trying to cosmically justify for tax purposes uh, <laughs> how he purchased the giant Batwing. And now it's going to be research on his taxes for this episode of the podcast. So by interviewing you, he He's writes it off, he writes it off uh, during the for the IRS. So I yeah, it's a giant yes. scam, but thank you for being a part of it. Yeah. 
It's a two country scam, Dave. I live in the UK and I'm also a US taxpayer, so I'm planning to double deduct it, really. I'm gonna go but I'm gonna go whole hog both. You're places. gonna make money on that. You're gonna make That's money right. on it. That's yeah. right. Coming back around. Uh uh Julian, we're massive fans of your work. I was telling you sort of offline that I I was listening to a Batman related podcast and had heard uh, a wonderful interview with you on it. Uh and um, sort of, kn I knew your work, and from uh, from just having read far too much about Batman '89, and uh, knowing some some collectors who actually have your lovely work in frames and their in their places that I've seen, um, but I didn't know the kind of depth and breadth of everything that you had done, and certainly how um, how kind of uh, young and new to the business you were when uh, when you joined. Uh, Anton First's uh, team in in Batman. So um, we would love to, I think that's, I I would love to just kind of start there is like, how do you go from being a, um, you know, an illustrator to suddenly finding yourself working on, even at the time, one of the biggest films that was ever mounted in uh, the UK film industry? Well, uh, it wasn't, it sort of was a plan and it sort of wasn't a plan because I wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't my first job. In the film industry, I had been working in creature effects for oh. three or four years before that. Um, build, building them and making them, or was there a design aspect to it as well? No, building. I'm, oh, really? I, okay. I, when I was at college, I, I was doing film and TV studies, and I wanted to make a film of The Company of Wolves. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the story, the Angela carter short story well, it's i don't i don't know the book i only know the the movie that was yeah. eventually made yeah yeah now as i was making this half animated half live action film i started to learn all about creature effects and of course the howling had come out american werewolf had come out i think the thing had just was about to come out so i was kind of really fascinated by all this stuff and um i built a lot of stuff myself and um, it just so happened that the woman who ran the hostels at the college knew Nick Dudman, who's a well-known makeup artist, and he had just done Return of the Jedi, I think. And I went to go and see, I went to go and see him on Legend. He was working on Legend for Rob Bottin. Oh, wow. Very cool. Oh, cool. And through that, I met a few people, one of whom was uh, Steve Norrington, who I became friends with. Mm -hmm. And uh, he basically got me a job or an interview with Stan Winston for Aliens, where wow. I was just painting uh, like suits, painting alien suits and, uh, and uh, face huggers and things like that and doing little odd jobs here and there, but making tea and doing those things as well. So it was a sort of a big adventure. And I thought that, at that stage, I thought all movies were going to be like those adventures, but uh, <laughs> that was that was pretty high up there. Uh, it was a great experience, and it was you. The thing is, is that when you find out about documentaries about aliens now, you hear about all of the 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 sort of friction there was between British crews and James Cameron, and I wasn't privy to this at all. I mean, I was aware that there was a walkout, but I was just like. I'm on a set, I'm on a space set, you know, this space set. And uh, I was just, you know, mega excited for that. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really that good at doing uh, creature effects. I would always be scribbling and doing drawings. And I did three or four films. I did Hellraiser. What else did I do? Willow. And then I did a movie called um, High Spirits. Which was designed, and, and this was all creature effects at this point. Yes, yes, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yes, I worked for Nick Dardman and Stan Winston, mainly, mainly, mainly Nick. And then on High Spirits, I had sort of a, by then I'd assembled quite a sort of big sort of uh, folio of just illustration, just crayon illustrations of various sort of imagined films. Um, and I took it to Anton First's office, and I knew he'd done Company of Wolves, and I had some drawings in there that I'd done for my production of, unfinished production of Company of Wolves. 
And he responded really well to it. And he introduced me to Nigel Phelps, who at that time was his art director, now a, a designer in his own right, and said, well, I've got no work for you on this, but we're going to do a Batman film. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, that sounds like a fun thing to do. Um, and I probably bugged him on the phone. And, you know, how many times do you phone someone up in the evening before they think, when is this guy going to leave me alone? Right. But I, better also, just, I better just give him a job to shut him up, if nothing else. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> um, and uh, pretty soon I found myself at Pyramid Studios in A Block. Can I ask one question? In yeah. this period, as a film fan, you were in fil- you had been in film school, like you mentioned you were a fan of the thing. So like just backing up just a touch, like when all of a sudden you're doing something that Rob Bottin is connected to or Stan Winston, were you were you like young film geek? Like, oh my God, Stan Winston, oh my God, Rob Bottin, or oh, yeah. oh my God, Anton First. So like were these heady days for you really? Like like these were names oh, you knew. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I mean the thing was is I was very young, and I mean I just come through the door as a runner, and I, I to me I I felt I'd already made it. We can forget any right. hierarchy. I was there, you know. I was just the fact that you got in. Yeah, okay. I yeah, that. yeah, absolutely. So I probably behaved very arrogantly, and um, and I can remember sort of doing some sort of break dance thing. Um, in the aliens office, just as Stan walked in, it was like, Julian, what the hell are you doing? You know, <laughs> I always seem to get caught out goofing off or something like that, but uh, uh, it, it kind of didn't bother me because I just, I felt I was so lucky to just be there and, you know, be on the sets and, and, and seeing it all unfold. And, and also I had this, because Alien was such a favorite movie of mine, I was kind of seeing, let's see what this Canadian guy can do. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, he'd done Terminator, which I had, which I had liked a lot. Um, but I thought he was treading on some sort of sacred ground. You know, sure. imagine somebody, you know, trying to remake Jaws. Right. Uh, anyway, so so he or Game of Thrones, or, or Game of Thrones. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's again, it was a big ask, and uh, I wasn't convinced even when I was reading the script. What it, what it said on the page didn't it it translated very well because he had a fantastic cast but yeah. reading as an englishman you know about uh, you know we haven't seen the queen the badass and i'm like this doesn't seem right uh, but, <laughs> right but and yet you know, when it yeah they got bill pax and right. say you know and he do he you know turned in a brilliant performance and it is a very good script i mean looking at it now of course it's a good script yeah it's I incredible didn't read the script and it wasn't until I was sort of a few months in when it was, Julian, can you come onto the stage to help operate the Alien Queen? And it was the Queen power loader scene. Oh, wow. And it was an amazing set, you know, Peter Lamont set with the drop ship there, just everything going on, all the lights. And I just walked on the set and there was the, the Queen sort of being posed and Sigourney Weaver in the power loader. And I just looked at all of this and I just thought, thought this film's going to be massive. <laughs> what uh what part of the queen were you operating were you a, a tail or rear leg or you did this you were an extra hand gotcha it varied yeah because it was just a question of how much of the queen they had on the set sometimes they would only have you know a section of it but right during the fight there was legs moving and tail moving jaw um so it varied sometimes i'd be doing the mouth sometimes i'd be doing the the tongue oh cool that's good. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't kind of like a bagsy, I bagsy this limb. It was right. just like you, you know. Did you get some direct interaction with that Canadian guy whose name no one can ever remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, actually, out of probably all of the films that I'd done, I had more interaction with him as a director than probably most directors I've worked since. Unless you're counting storyboarding, but that's a completely different kind right. of relationship. Different period, yes, exactly. Is that just because he's so hands-on and so in everything? Is that a Cameron trait as opposed – I mean, I'm not looking to dump on other directors. Is that just part of his nature that he gets to know? He's sort of in every part of it, or do you have a sense of it? Well, when you see him work, even when he's sort of 
getting agitated that not everybody on the film is sharing his vision. You know, some of them are tired and want to go home for, you know, and he, he could get frustrated. Um, and I think, I mean, there's plenty of stories about his relationship with the British crew, but you couldn't help but see that, you know, the guy was like, he knew most people's jobs better than they knew their own. Right. That and he was very compartmentalized. Story, yeah. So he might be shouting at one guy about something that wasn't ready. And of course, like all directors, he's under the cosh of the, uh, you know, the schedule. And he's wanting to get everything, certain shots done by the end of the day. So, and, and, and by the way, because he was the first director I worked with, I just sort of thought, well, this is how directors behave. But uh, I didn't really have any problem with it. And um, I can remember just feeling sort of a lot of pressure. I remember standing on a box, you know, a box about three foot high, operating this uh, alien queen tail <laughs> on a very simple sort of rod with just a piece of wire that was spray black, no CGI back then. Um, and I was trying to manoeuvre this thing so that it went into the camera because there's, there's, there's a scene toward the end of the movie where... When she's Queen whipping, Canada, when she's like whipping the tail kind of a thing, that part of yes, it. Yes, right? at, yeah. at, at Sigourney Weaver, this way and that. And so this was the reverse POV shot. And I could not for the life of me get the tail to actually go toward the camera because of the the sort of as i moved it upwards it wanted to go left and um and james was getting very very agitated but we got there and we have about about 12 takes we managed to get there and you know everybody sort of cheered and probably some of the sort of elder statesmen of the the crew sort of clapped because they realized this little kid you know had sort of like they sort of they were sort of in my corner for having done it, and there was a few occasions like that. But um, you know, particularly towards the end of production, the final weeks, like I think it was a month, it may have been three weeks, where I've spoken about this before. That James Cameron paid for the whole production out of his pocket because he just had a whole bunch of shots that he needed, and he's not a man to compromise. So he just we 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 had a a, a little sort of American crew of the the miniature, people, miniature crew, the Skotak brothers, and most of the others were sort of the remnants of the British crew. So I was going around. There was so many setups on these two stages at Pinewood, and so I interacted with him every day, pretty much. Oh, that's really cool. When I fucked up, he told me I'd fucked up, and when I'd done a shot which looked great in rushes, he'd come up and say, Julian, that looked great. Well done. On to the next thing. So... I didn't have any problems with it. And I also had aspirations of being a director. So I was kind of feeling like, you know, can I behave better than this or will I be worse than this? Or, uh, you know, and so I was really actually very interested in what he did. And of course, you know, a few months later, we went to go and see the movie and it was just, you know, I'm actually in the movie for about three seconds as an alien. You were in, in a full. You were you were oh, in a costume cool. at one point. You're in one of the costumes. Yes, I was in a. Um, I was just in the proximity of this shot, where Vasquez gets attacked. Gets attacked by the alien in the air shaft toward the end, mm. and because I was the nearest guy, Jim just sort of said, "Oh, Julian, get in an alien suit," and I was like, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> and half an hour, I come back downstairs in this, you know, outfit. And I climbed into the air shaft and um, they were painting um, KY jelly on the face of the alien. <laughs> and obviously Jim was in a hurry, under pressure. He just, he said, stop messing about, you know, stand back. And he picked up this bucket of KY and just threw the whole thing into the air shaft. And it was absolutely <laughs> covered in KY, you know. Um, but it's I actually loved it because the, 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 the lights were really hot, so I didn't mind. Allow me to say, not the first time in the film industry someone has ended up covered in KY jelly. <laughs> it happens to. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you remember, this is uh, uh, neither here nor there, but do you remember Alec Gillis? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Alec. Oh, yeah, oh, cool. Yeah, Alex, uh, Alec is a friend. His, uh, his daughter actually was um, uh, an assistant of mine on my previous show uh who came she came up 
uh, as a writer's writer's PA and then, and then had done well. So she was actually my assistant on colony, which is my previous show. And I was a huge fan of Alex and his work and ADI and all that. So I, I got, I got to know him pretty well, but was that um, his daughter who was in the the, the 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 movie that he did? Uh, no, that's his that's his actor daughter. So th- this was his this is his writer daughter. <laughs> Different. Right. So he has a bunch of daughters that went to, uh, went film business. This is Devin. Yes. But yes, I like the idea that he has multiple daughters and one's like a producer, one's a director, one's yeah. an actor, it's a one's whole, a writer. It's a whole yeah. film crew. Yeah, yeah, a very strange exactly. sort of yeah contest. So, yeah. So Julian, are you? I mean, you're obviously you're you're a, an accomplished artist at this point because you're drawing and you're submitting to Anton first and getting his attention. Were you were you classically trained? Did you go to art school for for this, or are you self taught? I went to art school. Yeah, um, yes, I went to art school in Croydon in Surrey, which is where I live now. I'm just out, I live just outside Croydon, which is just outside London. I did two years at Croydon doing art and design, and then I did three years in West Surrey College doing film and TV. Did going from, cre- did because I, I imagine it usually kind of goes the other way where you're you're sort of in the back office and then you kind of move on to the floor. You went you, you went from creature department to then working art department. Did that inform the way you were designing things? Seeing the way people have to actually interact with the things and knowing that eventually your designs have to come to life and be made practically by real people with real materials. Did that change the way that you approached design? Well, n- I, what what I would say is that certainly um, working on Batman was a big learning curve. Sure, I didn't really understand what I was doing beyond the drawing. You know, scale and things like that were sort of something I learned as I went along. You know, because when I first did sort of drawings of the Batmobile, for instance, I didn't really know how big it would be. You know, I couldn't visualize what the guy would be like sitting behind the wheel behind that cockpit. I'd just drawn a sort of a dark cockpit. And when they, people like uh, um, Terry Ackland Snow, who art directed it and sort of rationalized it, shall we say, along with the sculptors, um, Eddie Butler and Keith Short, that determined the size of the thing. But in my head, I couldn't really... I mean, obviously, I realized it was a car, but when you see the car, I don't know if you've seen it in, in real life. It's although it's not very high, it's very long. You know? Long. Yeah. Yeah. So, I was I was lucky enough to I got invited onto the flash set when we were filming up at Leavesden. So I got to see not only the original car uh, in situ, but actually in the Batcave. So that was that that was my um, whatever happens from here. I'm I'm fine moment in my yeah in my... I, I would have liked to have done I, I actually worked on the flash but because of covid i didn't go up there you were uh, even there, though yeah. i was invited because you have to go in do your test come home which doesn't make any sense at all and then when you you were negative you could go in and it was a big to do yeah it was a t- doing to other do, things yeah. on the film anyway but i would have well, liked to have seen it again. for many months julian i drove past your work because you you designed the uh the um ussr set right the uh the the sort of postmodern uh ussr yeah yeah uh, yeah that was, that was, yeah that was a good thing that was a good fun thing to do um is that where they were forgive me keeping supergirl or whatever they yes, called her in the movie yeah, gotcha yeah. okay yep cool yeah. That was, I mean, I feel like we're jumping ahead, but I think, I don't know, I, this is something I was interested in, so we'll we'll work backwards. Mm-hmm. Having done Batman, basically, in the, the 80s, you then didn't work on any of the Batman movies, and then when Keaton comes back to finally play Batman again in this Flash movie, uh, obviously he wrote it into his contract that you had to be there. Um, was it interesting kind of going back? I mean, you know, we were talking about Alien to Aliens and the notion of sort of like, you know, you can't make a you know this is not going to be good like did you were you thinking or worried about going back to batman at all or was it a welcome sort of i want to do this like did you seek it out did they seek you out like i was just curious because it was so many years in a good in an interesting way well the thing with the flash was that you know i just got a call from um the supervising art director just so jason just saying do you want to come and work on the flash and i was like 
I'm aware of the TV series. What is it? And I, but I didn't know what the story was. Oh, they I, didn't. They didn't specifically say to you, "We're like, there's a whole Michael." They didn't sell it to no, you that no, way. No, oh, no. fascinating! I didn't even know. I, a supervising, uh, uh, um, a visual effects producer was the person who said, "Do you know that your car's in this film?" And I was like, "No, I had no idea." <laughs> so, um, so yes, it was. I'm glad that it is, and I'm glad that people are still excited to see that car. But uh, you know, it wasn't. It wasn't like my dream to go back to Batman, even though I would have loved to have worked on um, the Nolan the Batmans because I just sure. thought, thought sure. they were great. You know, yeah. forget the fact that it was Batman; they were just really good movies. You know? Well, th- there was a whole buzz that went through Leaves and Studios because I. So do I? Do you know if you remember him or if you cross paths with him? But Angus Bickerton, who was in, um, oh, Angus. yeah, visual effects on Batman. So he was he probably he's a contemporary of yours because you're that it was like one of his first jobs. He was young young man in his twenties doing that. And uh, he was the visual effects supervisor on first season of House of the Dragon. And uh, he knew I was a giant Batman fan. We talked about Batman all the time. And he came to me one day and he's like, so under cover of (laughs) night last night, I understand the 89 Batmobile was quietly brought on to the Leaveston Studios uh, lot. And uh, we have a picture of the trailer that it came in because they were working late and they took a picture of the thing as it shipped in because he had heard rumors. So it was this whole like everybody was a buzz that the Batmobile was back and around. And even I mean, the film people were all were all nuts about it. So it was great. But here's a here's a great compliment to you. I had no idea that you had. I had no idea that you had done work on the flash. And again, I drove past that set, you know, multiple times a day, every day for many, many months while we were shooting that very COVID delayed production. Mm. And the thing that I said to somebody was like, I think this movie is gonna be pretty good because whoever did this really captured the Anton first feel to me of that, that I, I don't know what you would even call it. That kind of larger than life, brutal gothic design of the first film where everything just felt huge and kind of like 1980s like superpowers like the 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 best and worst of the USA and the best and worst of the USSR like that was all captured to me in that in that particularly in that first movie in the way they des- architectural design and you could just see that on that on on that sort of you know those that russian set whatever you could see above the above the fence it just felt like well, that first it- the designer on that, uh, Paul Osterbury, is it Osterbury? Osterbury? He, he uh, I mean, he gave me a lot of guidance about where he wanted to go. It wasn't just, you know, go and do me a Russian missile silo. He, <laughs> yeah. I, would, I, I, I very rarely sort of go. I, I, I work with designers who will trust me implicitly to go off and say, here, what do you think of this? But I hadn't worked with Paul before, but he was great, really great, very supportive. And we did a lot of Zoom calls because, of course, I couldn't go in there. And uh, he gave me a lot of feedback. And as often happens, you know, as normally happens, we sort of found our way into a sort of an alignment where you go, mm, I'm not so sure about the size of this, I'm not so sure about the size of that. That's too tall. That's too short. Those windows seem a little bit. You know, he was quite specific about what he wanted. So, um, I can take credit for the actual images and where it ended up, but uh, not really the design. I don't think. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, you did do. You did. Sorry, really quick. While we're on Flash, and then we'll then and then we will go back. We to, should. I think do the Batman. actual thing. Yeah. But I was going to say you did do a little bit of the Batcave, right? A little some pieces of the Batcave did, in that as well. I did a section where the the character. The, I can't remember the name of the character. The Flash. The guy. Barry Allen. Allen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Where he's sitting in a chair and he's in this sort of electric chair. And I did that electric chair, um, just all of the, all the power cables and everything like that, and the where Batman was controlling that from. Right. So, yeah, so I did those those sections, but the, I, I certainly can't take uh, credit for the stage. No, so. of course. I'm just going to say even those sections, I mean, again, w- w- to whatever extent you were pushed pulled or whatever into those sections or you know you did it yourself there was nice continuity i mean i don't know the movie was hit and miss for me but the the michael keaton stuff all worked and Mm -hmm. the bat cave worked and everything that he was everything that was batman 89 was felt very good i so wherever Mm -hmm. that fits into your worldview uh it was very enjoyable that part of it so yeah i really liked how they'd updated the bat the bat wing as well um dan walker who's someone i've worked with before did that i think they did a really good job 
had a yeah. nice modern twist. And I actually felt like having the Batwing that I'd been involved in in that film wouldn't kind of, I don't think it would have fitted quite so well, particularly seeing as there's three people in it. Yeah. So. Yes. yeah. And he crashed it. It, it. it was, it was burned, burned up at the foot of the cathedral. Um, yeah. right. uh, but yes, I mean, I've said before, and I will, I will say again that that Batcave set is the craziest film set I have ever been on in my life. It was, I, it was just mind, mind blowing, mind blowing set. I'm very, um, I mean, I, they, I mean, I, I knew they threw some money at that thing and I think they were very clear that they didn't want to have green screen add-ons and stuff like that. They wanted it to nope. be, you know, a, a, a contained space. You know? It was a hundred percent to the walls of the stage there. I mean, to my memory, there was no green screen in there at all. It was all completely practical. There was an led screen that they used for that waterfall thing in there, but that was the only thing that, but even that was in camera. Cause it was, you know, it was, it was. Yeah an image of the thing that it was supposed to be. Um, so, so dialing back to 1988, uh, you're working, you're working on Batman and you find this job in the art department. Did, did you get hired specifically to do vehicles or were you just kind of doing drawings and they're sending you like, Hey, can I you actually, take a shot at this thing? I, I'm going to interrupt just because this was funny to me. And maybe I'd love to hear your take on your version of it. If you will, my understanding from some interview I read uh, of yours was basically that you initially were drawing buildings and you weren't doing a great job. And they kind of said, why don't you go work on the Batmobile? Or am I, am I doing that story justice? I mean, I, I was sort of well, curious. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a hundred, it's not a million miles from the truth. It's, it's, I, I started doing, I started putting photocopies together with the street because they were trying to figure out with Les Tompkins, who's one of the art directors there, how they were going to do Gotham on the back lot. And he had been drawing, you know, various configurations of the street. And I was creating these, these sort of photocopy pictures of various um, buildings from black and white photographs of New York. And I was putting them together and they were all at different scales. Like the door on one was not the same size as the door on the other. So <laughs> I think Les was like, no, you've got to, pay attention to you know the size of the, where the gates are and the window heights and stuff like that and I was like uh, okay okay um but I think he was pretty far down the road on that but I did I did get taken off that I expect there was a conversation in another room like we got to get him off this but um but what happened is that this folio of stuff that I had um there was a drawing in it, which I can show you. I actually have it to hand. Oh, wow. Ooh. Love there visual aids. Can you see that? I'm trying to get the glare. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. It was sort of a futuristic car race. A car, a yeah, it looks like, uh, looks like death race, kind of. Yeah, that sort of thing. And the idea is that that thing on the right is a police car, and these are criminals in the foreground. Okay. Shooting them. Now, he had seen this. Anton had seen this. And um, I think he, I think he was probably struggling to find, as you say, for things for me to do. And he saw that, and he looked through the file, and he saw that, and he said, "Do you want to have a crack at the Batmobile?" And I was like, well, "Of course." <laughs> Actually, if somebody said that to me now, I might go have a different reaction. But I think I was too dumb to realize what a, you know, a responsibility that was. But you know, with his and Tim's input, you know, we, I think we did a pretty well, nowadays, good Nowadays, if somebody said, do you want to draw the Batmobile? They would not want to draw the Batmobile because your Batmobile exists. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You're, the, very, you're, you're the reason it becomes a very difficult job. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's very flattering. It took a, it took a little while to get there. And, you know, people say, did you design the Batmobile? And I sort of go, well, I was the illustrator of the Batmobile and I wouldn't have got to where I got without Anton's you know, pushing me and he's in charge sure, of course. And, and I was, I was producing cars for him, you know, um, I was a big fan of the Corvette Stingray, the old Stingray, when, which I actually saw one the other day, which I don't think I've ever seen one in the flesh before, not the, the old, I think 67 or. Yeah. Beautiful. The one with the, the, oh. the side pipes on it, right. The sort of the, yeah, the sloped it's, hood. It's, it's slits, which I did actually nick for the, for the Batmobile. But um, I was producing stuff like that with wings. And he was like, these are cars. We really need a 
sort of a brutal statement. And mm-hmm. it was then that I thought of the Green Monster, which was a, a land speed record car that I'd seen. Oh, one of those like rocket car kind of things. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Quick question. Where did comic books and or the 66 Adam West Batman show fit into your brain? Were they were they in there? Were you a comic book guy at all? Or like were these influences? Were they in the office? I'm just curious. Yeah, I was I was a comic book book fan as a kid. But Batman was I was only really familiar with Batman as the Adam West TV show. Gotcha. Which I would have been about seven or eight when I saw sure, that. Sure. I liked it. You know, it's yeah, fun. I mean, you yeah. look at it now and it looks faintly ridiculous. But then what do you measure it against right. back then? Yeah. yeah, it was and great the fun. Batman, uh, the Batmobile was pretty good even now. I mean, I mean obviously, yeah. yeah. I mean, that holds I up. Really so, yeah, yeah. And in fact, one of the, the drawings that I did of the Batmobile before I came up with the one that we used, I had two cockpits on either side of this jet which I kind of really just stole from the TV show because it remember Batman and Robin had their own little sort, sort of side of pieces. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it was definitely an influence, perhaps too much of an influence because I was sort of going for the, you know, the sort of Buicks and Cadillacs of way back when with everything yeah. with fins. And uh, I think I got steadied into the car because Nigel Phelps, who was doing all the beautiful drawings of Gotham along with Anton, They'd kind of got that sorted. You know, where was I going to fit in? I was doing too much science fiction type stuff as opposed to the stuff that they were producing. Um, but the car. Yeah, this is almost like a, re- a retro thing. This feels like. I've been to the. Uh, I, I just was at the um, Hampton Court Palace car show out oh, here yeah. in London. In in uh, in in London, and there were there's uh, beautiful cars there. You know, crazy things from the 60s and 70s. But there also there's this whole row that I always get fascinated with of 30s automobiles that I know nothing about. And a lot of these are things that there were three built or one built and they're very evocative of your Batmobile design. It's that kind of pre-depression, post roaring twenties that I don't know, thirties art deco kind of, you know, pre-war look when everything was sort of starting to look very futuristic before it got really, I thought, think put in check by the war when everything got very practical and boxy again and um the batmobile feels to me like it would if you pulled one up there it would just it would just fit right in with that entire row of cars well there was a lot of discussion there was a lot of discussion i remember the word bakelite came up a lot you know what bakelite is right it's kind yeah of the real, um the material like kind of that, cheap, yeah. yeah yeah cast they used to make gun design, grips out of it yeah a lot of design done in the 30s and 40s for that and and so if you look at the little um um utility belt stuff that was all very much baker like hmm. um you know uh, it, it's all very much taken from lots of those designs like telephone designs and stuff like that um from that period so yes it took me a little while to come down from this sort of science fiction sort of place to get into this deco place which anton was kind of residing in <laughs> um but uh, there was a beautiful car called the Golden Arrow, which is at Bewley. You can see it in Bewley if you're interested in that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, I, looked up, I looked up your green monster. It's uh, I, yeah. I totally see the influence. It's, oh, yeah. What's, I mean, what's, I, what's, what's this one called? The Golden what? The Golden Arrow. And it was a, a land speed record thing. Oh, I sure. Yeah. British from the yeah from the, I think from the 30s and that's there that's that's like that's a fantastic looking car yeah that's cool um, do any of these cars have small monkey radiator caps <laughs> on them like those Dave. decorative monkey uh you know that they, they would have very different little like animals and totems on the radiator it's going so well Dave Dave, <laughs> was... Dave has a collecting problem of monkey radiator caps very specifically okay. From yeah. like the thirties, like old cars from the thirties, like where there were not a lot of them. So, <laughs> well, I, I, we could have had a nodding dog on there, or a nodding bat, or something. Like that. Yeah. yeah, there yeah. you go. See, not so hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also, uh, Julian, you rem- you mentioned in a previous interview, which I I never it never occurred to me, but then as soon as you said it, I said, ah, of course, the um the uh, the the Chuck Yeager plane 
uh, which I forget what that was called, but the influence of that on this sort of the, rocket is engine. That, is that the MX-1 or no? No, the, the Glorious, Glen the, Glorious Glennis, right? That was the, his name of it? Well, that, the X-1, yeah. That, X-1, that, yeah. Yeah, that, the cockpit of that, it was actually... From right stuff, yeah. Yeah, but actually, if you look at the X-15, which came a little bit Blink. later, the Blackbird. Oh, no, sorry, not the Blackbird. The X-15 is different, sorry. That X-15... Oh, the SR-71. Yeah, the SR-71, but actually it was the X-15. If you look at a picture of an X-15, which was what uh, um, uh, Armstrong was flying before he was in the Apollo program. Yeah, uh, yeah. But Jack Yeager did fly it, you're correct. He actually flew it with 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 Armstrong. Um, but, yeah, that's that's where the cockpit of the, 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 uh, the Batmobile came from. Uh, yeah and then and then i well i was also thinking of the the turb the sort of turbine engine at the front but i guess that's sort of that green monster you know the the i don't know the the nose cone on the on the front of the batmobile yes yes i mean that the i'd originally sort of had this picture in my illustration of this sort of red point but again that was sort of, that was all a little bit 50s i think um it was probably wrong for it um but it was actually Anton who found this. It's kind of that you, you've seen that it's got a very weird droop to it. That front thing in the middle of the yeah. radial engine. Where that came from, I do not know. But I remember a props, uh, um, a guy, props guy, sort of just bringing this sort of box of, I think it was just from, um, you know, these yards that have all of this stuff. And he just picked out five or six of them, and Anton picked up that, and they said, "That's the one." <laughs> so, and I was like, "Really?" But actually, when it goes on there, it, it, it's kind yeah, of yeah, it all works, and, and also sort of you know quite comically phallic as well. How yeah. inv how involved were you on that one in terms of the journey from your drawings? to the car obviously there's sculpting there's other drawings and whatnot but did you get to participate in that or were you mostly on to the next thing the batwing or whatever well a bit of both but anton did encourage me to sort of go to the shed where it was being sculpted by keith Shaw and eddie butler and they did a just a magnificent job there and their translation from my not great perspective sketch to what they ended up with. I like to think I had a bit of input into that. And, and, and I think Anton encouraged me to go up there and see how it was going. But I also did some sort of um, drawings on the, on the drawing board of the grills in front of the windows, in front of the uh -huh. windscreen. And I did drawings of the, the caps which cover the machine guns. And also some of the side detail. Um, I'm not sure who is responsible for the all of that sort of uh, great uh, steel sort of chutney in front, behind the front wheel. I don't know who did that, but uh, they did a magnificent job there. And it really improved the car because it was kind of too slick. And then having that sort of made it feel like much more powerful than had that not been there. Mm -hmm. um, so I was involved up to a point, but you're right. I was kind of onto the next thing, like the, the, the bat wing and uh, the utility belt. Were you around when it, for lack of a better word, rolled onto the set, the actual? I uh, was. The, the, yeah. Yeah. But Anton was very good like that because whenever something like that happened, he would always say, you know, go up to the shop and have a look at that. Go up to the shop and have a look oh, at that. Oh, that's excellent. And um, I remember it was they were doing night shooting and Tim Burton was very ill with the flu, but he was on the set. For, you know, his nose was very red, didn't look very well, but I don't think he had a choice of within himself to just sort of say, Oh, you go and you go and sort of sort out the next week's shooting. I think he just sort of braved his way through. And I remember I went to go and see him and I sort of said on the set, on the back lot, and there was all steam coming out of the manhole covers and, extras everywhere and it looked amazing um probably one of the best sets i've ever been on but um i said to him yeah how are you feeling and he said yeah not so good so where is the car and he said it was just there 
and I'd walk right past it because it's so low, you don't really notice it. And it was it was parked between two other cars, but it did look great on the set. I was like, it was it was wild. And it, in fact, you know, uh, the funny thing is, is whenever you see it in the movie, it looks blue because of the way that it's lit. And I've had lots of people speaking to me recently saying, what color was it really? And I said, I can't really remember. I remember it looked like a beetle. You know, it had a sort of a sheen of a black mm. beetle. But there's people making toys of it now. And they, they're sort of saying, what color was it? And I was like, well, I just remember it looking like a beetle. But I only ever saw it at night or when it was right. not finished and finished painting. So it's kind of a weird sort of piece, missing piece of my sort of memory puzzle as far as the car is concerned. But yeah, it looked great on the back lot. And it was, I, I can remember Chris Kenny, who was the line producer, sort of calling him into me into his office and saying, come and have a look at the trailer. And I was like, oh, of course, you know, he'd stuck a VHS in. And I don't know if you remember, but the very first shot is the, the jet of the Batmobile. Right. Yeah. The rear of it. That's the very first shot. And I was just like, God, oh, this is great. You know? And it looked great. And it was going along the street, being chased by Joker's cars and. I just thought it looked fantastic. Yeah. So was the um was the Batwing next, or were you were you just yeah? Were you, pretty much. I know you you got involved with gadgets as well. Yeah. I think the Batwing. I think that I I think the Batwing was next. Yeah. And I seem to remember that being a pretty much a much shorter process finding the 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 idea. Um. Do you remember, was the moment in the script of, like, was it written in? I, I, I can't remember from the script, but maybe, Ryan, you'd remember too. Like the moment of the, the sorry, the, the bat wing going on to, in front of the moon and kind of creating the bat signal. So did you know going into the design that you were going to be very bat logo-like, or was that just part of the design process? No, I, I, the, 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 the thing was, was I had bought, I, I'd had to go up to London to sort of do some research into stealth aircraft because <laughs> we, we didn't have the internet and, and right. also we didn't have stealth aircraft yet. So these books or are- Did we, but it was so stealth, we didn't well, know it existed. Yeah. They, you, yes, I think you're probably right. It just wasn't <laughs> officially known about that then. So everybody had lots of ideas of what these things would look like. And I can remember I had this book and it had, it was like almost a disc, this aircraft with a sort of a, a cockpit and a sharp nose comb coming out the front. And it looked like it was on the edge of space. It was an artist's impression. And I thought, thought to myself, well, with this disc, it's not too much of a stretch that it's just a bat symbol. Oh, wow. I remember, okay. And, uh, I remember sort of thinking that the bat symbol should be, I had a, had an issue at the first, which way it should be flying. Cause obviously with one point that would make more sense. Like on the bottom of the bat, that's one point. But I, I, I think, I think it was Anton said, no, 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 no. We've got to have it the right way up. And I was like, okay. So that's how we have the two ears being the front as it were. Um, but yeah, we very quickly came to the bat symbol shape as a shape for the, for the jet. And I, I did had a, had a little dabbling with sort of micro light sort of technology, but you don't want to see those. They were pretty bad. <laughs> uh, and well, the um, design is perfect. So, uh, well done. Well, it's, yeah, it, it came out pretty well, but yeah, there was a lot of little hands making sure that it did work. Um, um, yeah, there was, uh, when I drew it, it was, again, I had this scale problem. If you look at my initial drawings, it's, it's a, it's a big beast. And, uh, of course I hadn't taken into account that it had to go down the street <laughs> and crash. Oh, sure. Yeah. So it wouldn't have even made it down the street with my design. It wouldn't have fit. So it, it would have just been too wide. Gotcha. Yeah. So basically what happened was the, 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 the body got smaller while the cockpit stayed, stayed the same size. I did do some, some planned sectional elevations of it, but they weren't very detailed, but there was a guy called Mike Boone who did the drawings of it, which it was modeled from, um, 
but I had always thought when we had this this bat shape that we we should get it in front of the moon, right? Um, seemed like a sort of a you know brainer, like the bat symbol that gets shot into the sky. But I thought, how do you shoot a thing? How do you shoot it and have the moon behind it so that it stays there? Are you sort of panning around it? And then it was the storyboard artist, Michael White, said, no, no, just have it go up and stall in front of the moon. So it was actually it was actually Michael White, the storyboard artist, who came up with that shot where it comes down. Great. Yeah. And then and then Angus was one of the the team members there trying to figure out how to actually shoot that shot. I remember him there. He actually did a couple of visual effects shots for me on a short film I did. But he, uh, yes, I remember him being on the set there with Derek Meddings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was, that was, that, that, that's, those st sets look fantastic. All righty, gang, get your next Holy Grail collector's piece at Prop Store's London Live Auction. Your Holy Grail collector's piece. My least favorite term in uh, hobbying, by the way. Uh, I, I cannot stand when people use uh, the word Holy Grail. So thank you, Prop Store, for using that term right in the opening sentence of the ad. Comic book fans assemble. This November, Prop Store is hosting an epic auction filled with iconic memorabilia from your favorite heroes, including Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, and so much more. Whether you're into Gotham's Dark Knight, which is Batman, or Earth's mightiest heroes, like Spider-Man, this is an event you won't want to miss, especially if you love Batman, or Spider-Man, or Superman. And did we mention Batman? Legendary pieces, like Michelle Pfeiffer's unforgettable Catwoman bodysuit and Michael Keaton's classic Batsuit from Batman Returns will be up for grabs, and he plays Batman in the movie Batman Returns and in Batman. Or if Spider-Man's more your style, you'll definitely want to bid on Willem Dafoe's iconic Green Goblin costume. It's actually almost more like an armor, kind of. It's like a whole metal, almost like an armor from Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, starring Spider-Man. Pre-bidding is opening with is open now, right now, with the auction culminating in an exciting four-day live event, November 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, with over 1,800 rare and iconic items from all your favorite films like Batman and Superman and Spider-Man and TV shows going under the hammer over at PropStore.com. Can't make it to the live auction but still want to feel the thrill of bidding? Don't worry, we've got three easy ways to make sure you don't miss out on your next must-have piece from Batman, Superman, or Spider-Man. Absentee bidding. Can't be there live? No problem. Just fill out the auction form, list the items you want, and set your max bid. The prop store team will handle the rest, like Batman would. Telephone bidding. Want to feel the thrill of the live auction, but your Wi-Fi isn't reliable? Try telephone bidding. It's super easy. Just fill out the form and we'll assign you a personal phone clerk. They'll call you during the auction so you can bid live right in the moment, unless you're on an airplane. And SMS alerts. Afraid you might miss the chance to bid? Set up an SMS alert for all your favorite items. Just click the SMS alerts button on any lot and we'll text you when your item is coming up to give you a reminder that it's time to bid. Like Batman. Don't miss out on a piece of comic book history like Superman, Spider-Man, or Batman in Prop Store's November live auction. From screen match props and original costumes from Superman, Batman, and or Spider-Man to one-of-a-kind music memorabilia from bands like Batman, visit PropStore.com to browse the full catalog, register, and start bidding today. That's PropStore.com. P-R-O-P-S-T-O-R dot com. That's a new song. Do you like it? Um, your uh, the other big Batman piece, just because I'm not sure where we're going to get to, but I want to finish. I want to get Batman done, if nothing else. Um, obviously the uh, the I guess what what I think of as the grapple gun, but really almost just the I don't know what to call it. The sort of <laughs> the, the 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 body of the gun, which has been used so many different times and places. It really right. has. It, you know, it's funny. Every movie sort of often now has their own. Batmobile, you know, they try and do something different. Sometimes they have other bat vehicles and whatnot. But that that basic sort of gun, again, I don't know what quite to call it or what, what you called it, um, feels like it has sustained itself through multiple bat incarnations, like the like the notion of yeah, his, did, his did. gadgets in a really wonderful way. 
Yeah, they did some. They didn't they? They did have something in the in the Nolan films, which was yeah, similar. Even, yeah, even 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 in their obsession of the reality of how Batman would be real, he kind of ended up with something not that different. Yeah, it's still it's yeah. still a grapp- it's yeah. still a grappling hook. And my understanding, Dave, and you, you could speak to this as a as a comics guy that you know predates the eighty because my introduction to comics was Batman eighty nine. My understanding is that actually Batman never had a grappling hook gun until that was an invention of the movie. And then the comic book sort of caught up to it. So I think he would have his, he would like swing yeah, his batarang or whatever. Yeah, he would batarang and throw it or whatever and obviously yeah. pull random yeah, things out. We, yeah, we, we, we did have a, a batarang as well, which sort sure. of folded up. The, the, the idea was that we decided that nothing in his belt should be bigger than a, a cassette tape. Hmm. So that kind of pro- po- posed a problem but also sort of provided some opportunities so i was trying to think how the hell do you do a gun that small that you hold in your hand so that was the i that was where the idea to stick two things together from right. basically different pockets which you never see fortunately you know from some nice um ray lovejoy editing you don't ever have to see him sort of, you know, <laughs> messing about with these things um, but that was the idea behind that was that this base could actually do be used for several different things. I can't. I, I think. I think I did drawings for several gadgets which either got cut out of the script, or um, I can't remember. There was, but I do remember putting a lot of things on the front of it that which didn't appear in the film. And um, yeah, that so was always cool. a challenge to get it so small that it. You could believe that it was on his belt, even though you never really yeah. saw the objects on his belt like you did in the '60s TV show. And did you get to see when they when they built them all? Did you get to see how that all how, how that all worked practically? Did they show you and the you know the firing one and all? Did you get to see any of that? I got to see them in in uh, is it John Evans, the the, uh, the, yeah. the the special effects in his office. But again, the only reason I did was because even though I was sort of focused on my table, you know, drawing the drawing of whatever, Anton always encouraged me to go up and see how things were, yeah. were progressing. Yeah. When you That's think cool. back, when you think back, sorry, forgive me, on your career a little bit, I mean, do you think of Anton as your mentor? Would that be a, a, the, the word? Yeah, that, or would do you... a, that would not be an inaccurate description. He certainly, I think I had a rapport with him. Um, and he, he was kind of like a, you know, like an uncle almost. Because yeah, yeah. he would, he would during that film, he would have people over to his house almost you know, every fortnight, you know, f- for a meal. So it wasn't just, it mm-hmm. wasn't just work. It was kind of relationships, you know. That's lovely. Um, yes, he was a lovely guy. So of course, when he when he died, I was yes, yeah, so it was that was very sad. Um, yeah. But it, the but Nigel who was his right hand man. I worked for him many times as well. And I have a sort of similar rapport with him. And I, Nigel's somebody who trusts me to go away and come up with something. (laughs) So it's it's about, I mean, the thing is, is that movies very often have to be about communication. I mean, and in this sort of digital age, actually, I don't seem to communicate with, I seem to have more opportunities to communicate and less opportunities more opportunities in terms of software and whatever but uh i don't actually get to speak to directors one-on-one very often but then is that just is that just the size of these movies in some cases is that just the scope i mean these things have gotten so big and also the schedule you know when 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 you look at the schedules of movies um you know 30 years ago you had much more time now 12 weeks you know you can make a movie you're expected to make an epic in 12 weeks and uh, right. there's very few people who can do that. So obviously you, you, you have to have a few people who you can send out to get your information back from. The thing that I would add, and I look, obviously there are exceptions to everything, but when obviously, cause it's easy to cut pre-production time, it's a great way of just, you know, lowering your budget. Well, we'll have everybody work, you know, a little less at the beginning is that you do end up with some of these big movies where 
things look like other big movies. And I have, I've always thought it's because of the lack of pre-production, that they're not given the time to figure out a new Batmobile. And I don't mean to, I'm not looking to, I'm not talking specifically about the Batman series. I'm just saying in general, you sometimes, I don't know if you, this is something you think about from an art side where like, you'll see a lot of movies and kind of go, God, all those aliens look alike or all those creatures look alike or all those foreign, whatever alien worlds look alike and it just seems like i don't know i don't know if it's a group think i don't, you know, I don't know i've always yeah. thought a little bit of the the lack of pre-production time that you don't have the let's explore i don't know maybe i don't know if you have a um, thought on that i think i think there are several factors there it's like personnel money is a factor but personnel there's per, you know personnel who are very very good at putting together a movie and going back to james cameron he spent God knows how many millions doing Avatar, and he had like God knows how long pre-production. So of course it looked amazing. Yeah, of course it looked amazing. But you could also very well spend um, that amount of time with somebody who hasn't really got the vision. Who says, "Oh, give me something else. Give me something right. else." You get a lot of, uh, uh, of of people who know what they want when they see it, but not until they do. And people like Jim Cameron, because he's a really good artist, he can show you what he wants. Look, just do that. You know. But sure. um, so you could have a, 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 a you know, a sizable pre-production and just be pissing most of that away sure. because stuff being rejected, which will work. Because as, as I find that I, I can get frustrated on certain productions by going saying, this thing that I've given you will work for what it needs to do in the script. But they have to like it, and sometimes they don't really know what they want until it's there. So you, right. until yeah. they're comfortable, it's not going to be, it's not going to be the answer. Um, so there are, it's you. I always feel that you would, it would be better if you had more pre-production time. But it has to be a sort of a, there has to be a structure to it. There has to be a structure and a vision. I think. Yeah, I get yeah. it. I get it. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask also, and just to to bring it around to props for one second, what did you? When did you become aware, just in the course of your career, that people were, for lack of a better word, collecting? That people were, whether it was props, obviously you weren't building them, but maybe they were things that you designed. But even by the way, storyboards, your storyboards, your art, that people were interested. That collectors didn't just want to see it, but that there were people that wanted to own it. Do you remember it all when that entered into your world? Well, it was, it was probably quite early on because particularly with Batman, the way that movie was merchandised, you know, it was, the merch was everywhere. Yeah. And the idea of being able to go into a shop and buy, you know, a little matchbox um, Batmobile was amazing to me I was like this is this is what I, I i helped do this um so that was very cool and then a few years ago they i've got it up there you know you've got a batmobile kind of this big and now there's a guy out in europe building a batmobile like this and there's still this sort of desire and sort of longevity of those designs which is sort of very flattering and i'm really glad to have been a part of the the process but i suppose very early on i was I was aware that people were excited by stuff like that, but you don't always get the opportunity to do a prop like that that, that is um, that is sort of well known and sort of revered. Right. I mean, Forever, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I can't think of many things, but I mean, I, I worked on the Game of Thrones. I don't know if you knew this, Ryan. I did, yeah, yeah. But um, on that, I, I I did the Red Keep, the the original sort of Red Keep from the first series, which, which ah. obviously is expanded. Yeah. Um, but when I did it, I was like, number one, I didn't even know what Game of Thrones was. Number two, I had about sort of a week to come up with the idea. And, um, and number three, I had no idea where that road was going to lead, you know, and still, and then seeing it on the TV in various series, you know, nine, was it nine, eight, eight series? Eight of seasons. The and then you seasons, see it, yeah. you see your design. We, 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 <laughs> yeah. we use it again and again. I mean, it's yeah. we, you see it more probably in our series than you did in the original, just because everything is based there. The whole story yeah. is based there. Um, we actually we talked we use it so much, Julian, that we talked. We had a serious discussion about doing a Hogwarts style size bigature miniature 
um, right. for the Red Keep just because we shoot it so many times. It made it, it. There was a point where we toyed with the idea of actually building it because you, then you could just fly the camera around it and it wouldn't be a visual effect shot every time you you went there. But it that sort of went away sadly because oh, I got too very excited. That, that would have looked really good in your right behind you, Ryan, in lieu of that yeah. couch. That would have looked really yes. good. Yeah, yes. yeah. I can't help feeling it would have to be a little bit bigger than the Hogwarts. And I also think that probably someone someone would have decided to do a, uh, put it on a volume screen so they could have it any weather that they wanted. So it <laughs> yeah. probably wouldn't so they have could walk, They could walk by it left to right just repeatedly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it probably ended, wouldn't have ended up being cost effective. So what, I mean, what else did you do for, for Thrones? Because you worked on, you worked in the first season very early, yes? Very, the very first season, yes. Yeah for Gemma Jackson and um, it was pretty clear very soon that it was like, this is massive. Why am I only here for eight weeks? I should be here for like six months. This gets back to your uh, pre-production yeah. thing. So when I left, I think other people came in because it was just like it, it, this whole world, world building process was basically like Lord of the Rings, you know, it was, it was massive. And uh, so I was just quickly just scribbling and making these very quick 3D models. So I never really finished anything. That's that's something I find on a lot of things that I do is I think, ah, I would have loved to have had just two or three more days to make that look really good. But that's a selfish thing because I'm thinking of my folio, you know, six months down the line. Um, but recently I worked on the film and I was doing a prop for it. And I didn't get the chance to finish the 3D. So when I finished on the show, I just spent the next three days building it properly in my own time. And I just gave it back to them and said, uh, here, I, I want you to build it like, well, not I want you to build it like this, but here's the finished model so that it would yeah. end up looking like the drawing that I, I, I'd done. It, I'm sure it would have anyway. I think it was just me being, I don't know, control freak or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get that. And, I get that. And, yeah. And do you work entirely digitally now, Julian? Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, um, it's just it's so alterable, you know. And I think that certainly, sort of directors and uh, production designers, whoever, they like that thing that you can just alter something. Uh, whereas, I mean, for instance, when I did um, Lost in Space years back for Stephen Hopkins and New Line. Um, I did the robot for that. Mm. And it took me a week to just do a 2D sort of three quarters view of the robot. Um, now, it probably would take me about the same amount of time to do it, but then I could render it from any angle and do plan section elevation and give those pieces to whoever to actually build and machine those things. So it becomes a much more versatile way to work. And also you get to sort of actually know what you're making better. And um, when I think of, um, again, getting back to Dan Walker doing his bat wing for um, The Flash, he built the whole thing inside out so he knew the, what was gonna happen. When I was doing the bat wing, I, I kind of done the outside, but it had nothing to do with the inside. Um, and uh, a lot of the detail in this kind of something that just was somebody else's baby, really. But I understand everything you're saying about the back end. Do you miss, though, a little bit of like pencil on paper? Like, I don't know, is there, is there a difference in your brain or just a way like, like a looser or creativity or anything like that step or not really? Well... I probably did a lot less swearing back then <laughs> uh, just because, you know, with programs crashing or right. something I missed or a frustration of figuring something out. But, I mean, literally this week I found an old um, drawing that I'd done on Judge Dredd, the Stallone film, um, of a, a side elevation of a of a um, a gun that I designed for the uh, the block war scene. I don't know if you've seen the film. Yep. Yeah. But um, it was a rejected design which I really liked, and then I 
just I've just been doing it in 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 three D, just as a sort of an exercise, really, and realizing that when I was doing those two D images, there's so much information that you're not giving the props department or construction or whoever by providing them with that. Because when you actually investigate the whole thing, you go, well, that doesn't make any sense. You, you, you get onto the end elevation, you realise that your barrel is wider than the body of your gun or something like that. Um, so uh, it's, I, 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 it's, it can be very um, rewarding to see the whole thing and actually give them something which actually can be used without them having to figure out a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't figure out. But, you know, there's so many... Yeah really brilliant sort of props guys and artists, you know, and, and great art department people who, um, who can figure those things out and sort those problems out. And, you know, yeah, you, uh, you designed the lawgiver, right? For the 95 dread. The, the lawgiver, for instance, was a, an image that was being produced before I came onto the film by a guy called Kev Walker, who was uh, a, 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 an illustrator for um, 2000 AD. Oh, okay. So he came up with the idea for the lawgiver for that. But what we had to do was clad his design around a real weapon so that you could have a blank oh. firing weapon. So I, I reproportioned it to fit around a Beretta. But uh, I can't take credit for the design for that one. I just, okay. I just, I, do, I kind of changed the proportion so that you could clad it yeah. around a, a Beretta, which was a sort of a challenge in itself because you have. Well, such you did the narrow... thing of making it making it practical, right? Well, yeah. you know, I was told we are we are using a Beretta for this, that's, uh, <laughs> so I had to make sure that it, you know, it wasn't too wide. So, like, like for instance, like the the grip of a gun, if you start putting too much cladding on it's 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 a very very precise bit of kit and yeah you, you if you're just i'm sure a beretta took you know years to perfect as a design but you've only got like four weeks to figure it out if that you know. sure you know from you know from drawing to the, the finished finished thing in fact i can remember doing the plan section elevation on the lawgiver and realized that I hated the look of the front because it's got a very bricky bottom, it's like a flat bottom like that. And I, and I, I remember going over to uh, special effects to Joss Williams, who was the, the head there and saying, I really think we need to change the bottom of the lawgiver because it looks too bricky. And he said, it's already built, you know? So, oh, okay. <laughs> so do maybe it. it was that incident that makes me want to do the 3D beforehand. Right, finalize it a little more. I get that. Yeah. But that's, that gun gets a lot of love as well. People like yes. to yeah. yeah, and it gets a lot of love, dare I say, for a movie that doesn't get a lot of love, which is kind of yeah. an interesting yes. combo. Yes, uh, but and definitely. There's some, good uh, stuff. there's some good stuff in that movie. Uh, it, was, it's, it was one of the most fun movies I did. Uh, yeah, the design's incredible. The ABC robot and the Judge Hunter. Yeah, everything and looks the, really good. Yeah. And as a comic book guy, the the what's the word i'm looking for the transfer from 2000 ad into a real yes. world and getting a chance to sort of see these things that you'd only sort of seen some drawings of or thought about or read about was really cool i i think you know stallone but anyway <laughs> it was, it was yeah. tough it was a tough summer for blockbusters i remember so you know. um but just looking through the, the, your body of work which is just just incredible one of the things i sort of was really fascinated by is just taking the topic of space. You've worked on sci-fi space. You've worked on closer to reality space, and then also things in between. So something like gravity, which is a, a, it feels very fact-based in the sense of this is the way you know our technology is working right now. And then something like The Martian, where you're kind of going, this is how we think it's going to work, but we're trying to keep it in, you know, closer to, yeah, again, yeah. The re, I, I guess that battle between reality and full-on sci-fi, do you have a preference? Obviously, reality affects your sci-fi work, but it just was really interesting to see you bounce around the various aspects of outer space, like the, just the full range that you've worked. I just thought it was really fascinating. Well, the thing with gravity was that was a thing I came into quite late in the production. Um, ah. 
and I was I was given some very very basic sort of 3D images of the angles that I was supposed to sort of flesh out. So I did a lot of photo bashing on that from the real International just, Space gotcha. Station, um, which was a bit of a challenge. Uh, but I only did a few images for that. I'm and I when I saw the film, I had no idea that it was going to be so like crazy, like the amount of damage. I was sort of told that there were some pieces of debris that were going to sort of break pieces off the ISS. But when you see it in the cinema, I was like, that's incredible. One of the most amazing shots I've seen in any film ever. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, we're doing the reality sort of science space. It's kind of beyond me because there's so much going on on something like the ISS, you know, most of which I don't know how it works. And then <laughs> I did a movie like Life, which was um, mm -hmm. did a few years back for Nigel again. And um, we kind of, he had a very clear idea of what he wanted to do on the inside. And I was kind of doing the outside. And I was obviously using the ISS for reference, but it's so it's such a busy exterior it would have taken me forever to try and get it to that level. And I'm sure Frame Store had to do exactly that when they did Gravity because they were emulating it pretty uh, faithfully. Yeah. But uh, pairing that back to a sort of slightly, a, a sort of a, almost not hyper reality, what's the word? It's designed. A sort of slightly designed reality. Sure. On life, that was that was but a still, great. Right, you're sort of looking at something and kind of going, "Yeah, that looks like this." What is, we think a space station looks like, but in yeah. fact, it is actually simplified and made a little sort of yeah. easier. Yeah. I that's that. the that's kind of really what you want to do if you when you when you're designing these things is have the audience when they look at it not be going, "Hang on, why is that like that?" Or would that work because as soon as you put sort of those questions into somebody's mind when they're watching whether it be fantasy or science fiction or a contemporary thing if you start putting those doubts in it you, you automatically become a spectator instead of somebody who's actually in right. the story sure so i think given it's important a, not so many questions in it Karen, sorry. given a given a choice i was gonna say given a choice between two scripts one that is sort of i guess hues closer to reality and one where you get to like I don't know what is what is a city on Saturn look like, or I don't know something that doesn't. Do you lean towards one just for your from your own sense of what would be more fun? And there's no right there's no right answer. And I realize the director might matter, and the star might matter, and the budget, and all those things. But pretending all things being equal, if I just said to you, do you want to draw? I don't know uh, New York City in 2035 or a planet we've never seen before. Do you have a, do you, do you, I don't know, do you lean one way or another? <laughs> well, there's a lot more freedom. There's a lot more freedom doing the, the, the city on yeah. Saturn. Um, so I, you know, I've done sort of Star Trek and stuff like that and done sort of buildings and you can sort of just go off and do your, your wild thing. But if you're doing something 10 years in the future, you're going to be thinking, what is, what is 10 years in the future right. going to look like? So that's much more of a sort of a challenge. And and also everybody's got an idea of what that is anyway. <laughs> right. So it's uh but I would say I'm I, I would feel more comfort more freedom doing something like Dune, for instance. Sure. Sure. Mm. Um, which I think they did a beautiful job on. Um they really and I would do, love yeah. to have been involved in, but what I was not to be. Well, before we get to the game, very important question. Mm. So Ryan, as you know, has purchased the the giant, was it five feet? I basically? won it, Dave. I won, won it. it. Yes. Won, he won it and purchased. Right. He won it. And then his prize was he got to purchase it. But giant so he voice. has the giant uh, five six foot. foot, six foot uh, yeah. uh, bat wing, which is incredible. Um, and we have been discussing the best way to display it. And I want your take on it, your artist's eye. I have mm. been arguing that he paints an entire wall in his house yellow, or at least a giant yellow circle on a wall, and then sort of puts it in that sort of stalled out bat, uh, bat signal mode with the big mm. yellow behind it. And I think mm. he's arguing more for sort of 
it in its sort of jet mode, sort of more flat, just kind of whatever. Uh, well, where I, do you fall? Yeah, I think I think you're you 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 you've gone so far with the yellow and the black. But why not just make an enormous Michael Keaton behind it and put it on his chest? Ooh, <laughs> uh, yeah, very very good. I you like that. Have, you don't need to have a knockout a story of your house. Or something. <laughs> yeah, no, a two story. No, this I'm liking. I'm liking this. All right. So, but I will argue technically there is yellow behind it, or yes. kind of and a I yellow can, orange. So, I yeah. can also deduct <laughs> yeah. all of this because, yeah. as we just said, this is all research for the podcast. All right. Well, that's excellent. Um, that's a good answer. I was not expecting Thank you, Julian. It. Uh, perfect. Um, uh, we like to play a little game, uh, and I. Uh, but let me ask you this. Sorry, we didn't even ask this. Do you collect it all? I mean, obviously, oh, yeah. you keeps you keep some of your own work. Do you keep mementos from like things you've worked on, whether it's your stuff or other people's stuff or things you designed? And somebody says, "Oh, you designed this. You want a little something?" I mean, do you keep stuff? Do you are you a collector at all? Well, I've got a couple of like toys of things that I sure. I, I did. Which I've sort of some of my, I've looked uh, looked after better than others, and mm -hmm. um, I did have stuff, as I said, you know, that I had to sell. I, um, I don't even want to tell you what they are; it's, you'd be heartbroken. But um, <laughs> the, the stuff that I've got, I, mean, I kind of want to see Ryan cry if you don't mind. But I mean, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, did just you keep a, Did you keep a spear gun from the first film? Did you keep one of those? No, I would have. I would have loved to have one, but but you can buy the little. You can buy the grappling hooks as a toy now. Yeah, yeah. The the um, Paragon makes a really nice. Yeah, really yeah. Nice uh, and they're, they're very accurate. I'm I'm happy to do that. You know, having the real thing obviously has value. Sure. But uh, you know, um, it's it's. Uh, I, I get less and less opportunity to to um, pick up stuff like that. I I suppose. When I was young, I wasn't sort of like uh, headstrong enough to just sort of steal stuff from people's uh, departments at the end of production. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's great seeing people hold these things in great value, hmm. and it's it's I, I can think of things that I would like to buy if I could afford them. Um, recently. I sort of could afford it, but I didn't have the space for it, as you see behind me. I saw that lovely Drew Star Wars poster. I don't know if you know which one I mean. It looks like it looks like a poster stuck over another poster. Oh yeah, the the yeah. circus the circus poster they call it. Yeah, it kind of looks really like it's on a that. fence. Met, yeah. Yes, and that I think that was one of these prop stores. I think it was Brandon who had that on on sale for about sort of. Yeah, what is it they call that? The, is that the Star Wars D? I think they call that the D poster. Because uh, it's like ABC. Yeah. I know the way you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. yeah, that's a yes. gorgeous poster. Yeah. Yes. Do you ever pay attention to like when one of your sketches or something show or a storyboard shows up from time to time? Do you ever pay attention to that? Well, I do just to make sure it is what they they say right. it is. Sure. Because I have to present it work, and they said, "I believe this is yours." I was like, I don't know. I have got, a, I've got, having said that, I've got a Terminator poster upstairs with which James Cameron signed for me when I went oh, to visit cool. him after. I... Oh, that's great. That's the first that's thing nice. I see when I come out of my toilet is Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Excellent. We play this game, and I think that usually it's we, we pick a certain movie. I think in this case, it's your it's your storied career. I would say the rule being, other than the Batmobile, if you could go back and and keep anything off of set that, that these these things that of, you designed and worked on movie these, these movies worked on. you just get one thing and don't worry about whether you've got room in your office for it or it can be yeah. anything we'll we'll magically give you the room to have it but you get to pick one thing from any movie you've worked on <laughs> just not the batmobile because that's the just that's not the, the go-to answer yeah. why can't i have the batmobile <laughs> Because I think we'd all pick the Batmobile. All three of us would pick the Batmobile, the and then there'd it's be no discussion. Over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd have to just kind of remember what. Yeah, there's so many sort of things that I know you've worked on a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So actually picking something out which people, somebody presented to me and say, "Here, we'd like you to have this." They're not. I tell you, they're, they're normally things that are films that I didn't work on. I wished I'd worked on. Oh, I'll tell you what, a prop I would love to oh, have in my house. Go for this. House, go for this. Be, What's your favorite thing? Yeah, which wouldn't fit. It would have to go in the kitchen, and my wife would have to do cooking somewhere else. Is that beautiful <laughs> pod 
out of 2001. You know, the little sure. yep. um, pod spaceship. Yeah. That's yeah. just a, such an incredible beautiful design. Yeah. And it was shot so fantastically in that film. Yeah. That's a pretty darn you have good it one. Sort of like a, like a personal pod, like, you know, have some music on in there. You know. yeah. you'll, probably, you'll probably be able to buy them somewhere. Know, Somebody makes a couple. one of those. The, yeah. the real one is on the, at the Academy Museum uh, in Los Angeles. Yep. On display there. Yeah, great. David, what about you? Well, I'm going to go grappling gun, which I'm guessing you are too. If I, if I could, something yeah, that, I mean, that you there... worked on, I, that would be the piece. I mean, especially if we're taking oh, the Batmobile off the table, that I grappling want, gun. I want yeah. the one though, the, 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 the kit, the kitty one that you can like, you can swap out the, you know, the different cartridges for and things like that. The, you know, the well, hero, you hero. All, the, all those things just vanished, Julian. Yeah, they now vanished you say that the, the spike gauntlet that I did for Batman, Ah, you know, with the two. Yeah, yeah, that one. The one that splits. Yeah, that, that one the one that pretty good shoots in the, into the, okay. the it's the museum scene, right? It's the, like the museum, that. the Flugelheim. Yeah. 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 Yes. That would look pretty good in a little display case. It'd that look would good look in your good. display case. It, it would. Really, really, it really good. Yeah. That, really, really good. That has yeah. also disappeared. All all that hardware. We, we've we spoken about this in a recent episode. All that hardware, Julian, disappeared. Warner doesn't have it. And it's just, it's in it's in the wind. And enough people at this point to talk to crew, unless the crew is keeping it and saying that they don't have it and they do. All that stuff is, is out there. So yeah. if, if you know anybody offline not on the podcast don't tell these people just tell me well i'll um, tell you after they you know offer me a fair price if i can't afford okay. it on to you very good <laughs> i'm guessing michael keaton or tim burton but that's just a guess it's a bad maybe a bad guess but that to me seems a lot more logical than random guy stole it but i could be wrong yeah maybe wrong yeah maybe they both well, seem I, like they keep they both seem like they keep things from movies oh, okay I guess. yeah yeah actors anyway. always get them it always drives me mad <laughs> they're so charming but, um, i would like to know where the the original sketch of the batmobile that i did is mm. i heard that it was in prince's estate oh wow but, uh, uh, i can't even remember who told me that but uh, that's that it, that's it, it would make sense it would make sense that's why yeah that's why i just i guess i just assumed that was with Tim Burton, because when you see his exhibits go around, it's so art focused. It's all the it's it's his original art, but then it's also the movie art. And of course, he didn't draw that one. It's usually the art that he drew. But I just I just figured because he's so art focused, it was that. And we've seen his his exhibits, and it's you see some cowls in it and, and things like that. But it's more stop motion creatures and those things that are very, very yeah Tim Burtony. That, that's the stuff that he's, yeah. yeah, the stuff that he seems to keep versus other things. But I, you know, we could all be. We could. All I will. I was also going to throw in there somewhere is I would love to see Anton first originals. I mean, I've I've seen like a drawing or two, but that to me would be just beautiful and striking. That mm. would be pretty incredible just to to really see the the breadth of his work on Batman. Like originals would be really incredible. Yeah, yeah he did some lovely yeah. work on 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 uh, Company of Wolves as well, actually. Oh yeah, I need to see that film now. Um, I, I added it to my It's fun. Notes. It's a fun movie. Yeah. It's got a weird sort of storybook atmosphere, which is kind mm. of nice. You know? Yeah, it feels a little other in a good way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Julian, this is yeah. terrific. Thank you this so much incredible. for joining us. Julian, do you want to plug your website? Uh, yeah. My website's on uh, on Crop, K R O P. K R O P. You just put that in with my name, you'll you'll find my website there. Fantastic. Right. Yeah, it's it's a lovely, uh a lovely sort of C V of all of the, the Yeah, a nice journey design. through your career and your designs. It's really fun to look at. Yeah. Um well thank you. This was just fantastic. And you made uh you made two grown men who saw batman many 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 years ago very very happy so very happy. Uh, yeah i was i stood in line from like 3 p.m on for like the eight o'clock show or something the night it came out in new york city so yeah very I very happy i dragged yeah. my parents to that theater uh many times that summer we're going back we're doing batman again so you you you, you sort of came out and then just went straight back in yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that was like that was i, I probably I probably paid four or five times that summer. I think I saw it four or five times in a theater. I just paid and went. Yeah. Well, the thing was a mo the movie I saw at the cinema the most times. Oh, great. yeah. I think I saw it eight times at the cinema. Ah, that's great. My winner is still Star Wars. That's the thing I've paid yeah, the most to actually see. Yeah. yeah, over and over and over. But yeah, well, that, you but Batman. 
Batman was up there. I think it might be Batman for me. Well, I'm glad it's still uh, appreciated. It, it it very much is, yeah. and it's alive. And my children are into it now, and and they're you know they're they have many Batman's to pick from, but that's the that's the one that they kind of gravitated to. So, um, this was fantastic. Uh, thank you so yes, much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, follow us uh, at Props Podcast. Write us. Dreams are made of podcast at gmail dot com. Uh, subscribe on YouTube. Rate yeah, us. Check like out us. our YouTube channel and subscribe to everything and rate us and everything. Comment and uh, come back next week when we will be back with another episode.